Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for the webinar uh, from CNL's WR1 decommissioning team and the NPD closure project. Uh, my name is Mike Giardini. I'm a communications officer for CNL's ERM stakeholder relations team. Uh, a few things before we get started. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge that the NPD site is located on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people and, the w and that the WR1 project is located on Treaty 1 and Treaty 3 territory, as well as the homeland of the Red River Métis. As an organization, CNL recognizes and appreciates uh, Indigenous peoples' connection to these places. CNL also recognizes the contributions that First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening the communities where these projects are situated and to this country as a whole. Today's webinar is to introduce you to CNL folks who work and support the WR1 and the NPD EA projects. We'll provide a brief update uh, on the project, uh, on the pro on the projects, and then uh, meet some team members. And uh, some of them will be familiar to you. Um, we'll start with the presentation, and then we'll open the floor for a Q and A discussion period. Um, there is simultaneous interpretation for this discussion. Uh, you can access the session in French and English through the globe icon on the bottom right of your bar on Zoom. Uh, select the language you'd like to hear. And uh, note that there's a slight lag if you do choose French. Um, so please wait for the full translation uh, to come through before speaking. Uh, please speak clearly, and we suggest using a headset if you have one. Uh, today's session is planned for about one hour. Uh, we anticipate the presentation will take about 30 minutes, and the rest of the time will be uh, set for discussion. Uh, please use the Q&A icon uh, to submit your questions. Uh, at any time during the presentation, and we'll respond to them afterwards. Uh, the Q&A icon is found at the bottom of your screen. Note that we are recording these sessions and uh, posting them on our YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, and if you have any issues, uh, please get in touch with us at ermstakeholder at cnl.ca. Uh, we'll be watching the inbox and uh, we'll try and get it sorted out for you. Now we'll introduce you to our uh, first speaker of the day, uh, Jeff Miller. Manager of Regulatory Approvals for, w, for WR1 Decommissioning. Jeff. Thanks, Mike. And uh, good morning, everybody across Canada joining us today. Um, again, my name is Jeff Miller, and uh, I'll be kicking things off today. Uh, can I see the next slide, please? Uh, as always, we're going to start with a brief introduction uh, to the two projects for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. Uh, but today we're also going to take a bit of a different approach in that uh, Courtney, Jesse, Margo, Graham, Peter, and myself are going to tell you a little bit more about ourselves and the work that we do at CNL, and specifically what we do for the WR1 and NPD projects. Uh, before uh, finishing up with a question and answer period at the end again. So uh, next slide, please. First, a little history, though. Uh, the WR1 reactor um, is at the White Shell site in Pinawa, Manitoba, and it played a key role in the nuclear history of Canada. It was built by General Electric and first treat, achieved criticality in 1965. It served for 20 years as a research reactor among, and, among other missions, uh, became a testing platform to support the CANDU reactor fleet. It was safely shut down in 1985 and since then has been maintained in a state of storage with surveillance. NPD uh, was the first Canadian nuclear power reactor and the proof of concept demonstration for what became the CANDU reactor. The NPD reactor made history in 1962 when it became the first nuclear power plant in Canada to produce electricity. And it became a proving ground for research and development that led to the commercial application of the CANDU system for generating electric power. That site in Ralston, Ontario has also been in safe shutdown state since the 1980s. Now, these are both legacy reactors in that they date back to kind of the dawn of the nuclear industry in Canada, WR1 as a research reactor and NPD as a can-do demonstration. Both of these reactors are built below grade. They're both built into or on the bedrock, and both have been in storage with surveillance for over 30 years. And it actually makes both of them uniquely suited for in-situ disposal, which is what CNL has proposed for both of these reactors. Next slide, please. In situ disposal is the disposal of these reactor facilities in place. And what that looks like for these reactors is backfilling of the facilities with grout, which is a flowable cement. 
leaving everything below ground in place. Uh, the grout encapsulates the materials and stabilizes the facility for the long term. And it turns the very substantial concrete structures of the reactor buildings into permanent multi-barrier waste disposal facilities that provide passively safe containment of the materials over their hazard, hazardous life. We hit the animation, please, Mike. One click should do it. Now, before we can execute this proposal, uh, CNL has to undergo a federal environmental assessment of the project. And that's where the projects currently are in the process. Both projects are uh, well along in developing and refining our environmental impact statements. Uh, the WR1 impact statement will be resubmitted in November to address the last three of the 208 information requests from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And that will kick off the next technical review of our, uh, our submissions. The NPD team has had planned to submit their revised uh, draft environmental impact statement addressing their remaining information requests to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, this spring uh, in summer of, or this spring and summer of 2022. Uh, but as an outcome of the concerns heard through the interventions at the hearings for the uh, near surface disposal facility at CNO and the subsequent procedural direction issued by the CNSC, they have chosen to postpone their submission of the draft EIS uh, for NPD to allow for additional Indigenous input. The date for submission of the draft right now is tentatively planned for January of 2023. Next slide, please. Now, uh, the fun part. Today, uh, we're actually going to be introducing the people that are working behind the scenes uh, supporting these projects. Uh, we're going to some, cover some of the key areas, including project management, environmental assessments and regulatory approval, engineering and design, Indigenous and stakeholder relations, environmental protection and monitoring, and safety assessments and licensing. Uh, so and while I'm here, I guess I will start as a project manager for WR1 for the uh, environmental impact statement for WR1 as well. Um, next slide, please. So again, my name is Jeff Miller, and I've been with CNL at the Whiteshell site in Pinawa for 15 years as of next week. And actually, 15 years ago today, I packed up everything on my own in my little Grand Am and drove out of my parents' house to start to start my uh, first big job. Uh, I was born in Scarborough, Ontario, and I grew up in Bowmanville, Ontario, in the, uh, the shadow of Darlington Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, I ended up out here for what was supposed to be a six-month training stint before transferring my branch back to the Chalk River site. But six months became a year, became four years, and by then I bought a house, I got married, I had kids, and I really made Penawa my home. So when the transfer did finally come, I turned it down and I took a job with the decommissioning project here at White Shell, and I've never regretted it. Uh, my family and I really love Penawa, and uh, given the proximity to Halloween, I thought I'd share one of our traditions with you all. Um, every year, my daughters and I dress up together in a common theme. And uh, more than once, that means trick-or-treating at my coworker's house in a dress or lipstick, but uh, at least that doesn't happen every year. Uh, so gold stars for anybody uh, who can name all seven th themes that I've got up here. Uh, we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. Next slide, please. But aside from my ridiculous Halloween morale boosters for our staff in Panama, what I actually do at CNL from a project manager standpoint is to really act as the leader and spokesman for the work that's being done both within CNL and to the public, hence me taking the lead on today's webinar. Uh, project managers, they assign tasks and priorities for the team to work on, as well as managing the cost and overall schedule of the project. In a lot of cases, we provide technical guidance and act as the acceptor or final approval of work or reports that are done by our team or by contractors supporting our team. Specifically for WR1, I'm responsible for ensuring that our environmental impact statement is completed and meets all of the regulations and expectations of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. I provide guidance and some decision-making authority for completing the various tasks needed to develop that environmental impact statement. And while not an official duty, I am also responsible for taking the team out for lunch when they do a great job. So, uh, but my motivations for taking them out for schnitzel might be slightly, uh, slightly selfish. Uh, but before I become that stereotypical talking head manager and, and talk too much, I'd like to turn you now over to our first speaker, uh, Courtney Power, who supports the environmental assessment and regulatory approvals component of, um, of the projects uh, at the, uh, the NPD site. So I'll turn it over to Courtney now. 
Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney Power. I work with the Nuclear Power Demonstration Closure Project as an environmental decommissioning and environmental specialist. I was born and raised in Conception Bay, South Newfoundland, which is a small town located on the southern shore of the Conception Bay on the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland. I grew up steps away from the Atlantic Ocean, and I like to get back to the East Coast whenever I can. I now live in Petawawa, Ontario with my husband and my two boys, and we very much enjoy the beauty of the Ottawa Valley. We spend a lot of time here swimming, paddleboarding, or searching for cool looking rocks on the shore. I've been working with CNL for over 12 years, and I greatly enjoy the work that I do. And it's very rewarding to be a part of a great multidisciplinary team working as part of the cleanup project and supporting the club mission. Next slide, please. So what do we do? As part of the MPD closure project, my work involves preparing and reviewing responses to technical questions from Indigenous peoples and public stakeholders on the MPD environmental impact statement. I also prepare and review other technical documents that are required for MPD's environmental assessment. As part of this important work, I work as part of a collaborative team to provide support for ongoing public Indigenous engagement activities. This includes preparing materials, participating in working groups, and presenting technical updates on the project. Now, as part of this role, I also participate in field activities. So this is, for example, species at risk surveys, migratory bird assessments, and sample collections at the MPD site. I also review environmental data as part of CMIL's follow-up monitoring activities. So how does this inform the project? Well, this work is important as we progress towards successfully completing the required environmental assessment for the MPD site, at which time this will require an amendment to the MPD site license. It is also important that public stakeholders and Indigenous peoples have a general awareness of the project which is achieved through communicating technical information in an accessible and easy to understand manner. Now through this interaction, CNIL is working to build and strengthen our relationships with Indigenous peoples and the public to promote both trust and understanding and to clearly demonstrate our commitment to protect the environment. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Courtney. Next up, uh, from our design and in our engineering and design portion, I'd like to introduce Jesse Gordon. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Gordon. I'm a project engineer on the WR1 project. Uh, I was born and raised in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and currently live in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I work at CNL because I'm interested in all things nuclear as well as it was time to move out of my parents' basement and an eight hour drive seemed like a reasonable amount of space. Uh, the photo on the left you see is of me and my girlfriend's cat, Mortimer. Uh, Mortimer is a very angry, angry cat, but he loves butt pats. Uh, the photo on the right is of a very steep run at Kicking Horse Mountain in Golden, BC from this March. I try to get at least one snowboard trip in each year. Next slide, please. Project engineers on the WR1 project uh, prepare decommissioning planning and execution documentation. We establish and oversee contracts for the design of the disposal facility. Uh, we provide technical support for work execution as well as tours to the public, Indigenous peoples, and other stakeholders. This impacts the project as it determines the steps taken to execute the decommissioning work, helps ensure that designs meet the requirements and are produced by qualified personnel. It allows for efficient problem solving if issues arise during execution and increases understanding of the project. As an example, the picture in the top right hand corner is of the end result of some scale up testing we recently performed on the grout formula for the WR1 project. 
this testing was designed to, to simulate grouting a room in the reactor facility. Uh, it allowed for observation of the interactions of the grout with many of the features found in the rooms to be grouted. It also allowed for comprehensive testing of the grout formula in a field setting. Back to you, Jeff. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, I can certainly confirm Mortimer's desire for butt pats has made its way into a video conference or two over the past couple of years. So uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, but up next from our Indigenous and Stakeholder Relations team, uh, some, someone many of, you, many of you may have already have had the pleasure to speak with or even meet, uh, Margot Thompson. Oh, no, is also moonlighting as the cat in the hat. <laughs> so I grew up, my name is Margaret Thompson, as Jeff said, and I grew up in southwestern Ontario in the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And I grew up in a very small town. And I currently live with my husband, daughter, and our dog, which who is a puggle, uh, which is a cross between a beagle and a pug. A uh, very interesting kind of dog. Very sweet, though. And the town I currently live in is 20 minutes from the same small town I grew up in. And I actually live in a smaller town than the town I grew up in. So the town I live in is about 800 people. And uh, yeah, I always thought I was going to live in a bigger, bigger town or bigger city, but I, I went the other way. So with CNL, I've worked since I started in 2015 and I work as a part of a remote team that supports our environment, environmental remediation projects across Canada. In particular, right now, I am supporting the Indigenous and Stakeholder Relations for the NPD Nuclear Power Demonstration Closure Project, as well as other reactor de decommissioning projects like Douglas Point, and that's not too far from where I live, from my home. So on the screen, you'll see two pictures, and they're both with my daughter. Unfortunately, after she was born, my dog and my husband kind of uh, started getting fewer pictures, although I, I'm sure they don't mind. <laughs> and on the left, it's a camping, it's a picture from a camping trip that we went on in Algonquin Park last summer in 2021. And some of you may recall, uh, not too far from the NPD site, actually, uh, Lake Travers in Algonquin Park, there was a, a relatively significant tornado for that part of the world that went through. So this is in front of that tornado damage. The tornado came through just the day before we were to go into the lake. And then on the right-hand side, there's a picture from last winter. I was out at my brother-in-law's property trying to teach my daughter to love winter like I do with cross-country skiing. And that cross-country skiing lasted probably about five minutes, probably long enough for that picture to be taken. Uh, so this year I'm hoping we make it a little bit longer. It's, she's only, she was only three that year. So it's hopefully, hopefully a little bit, a little bit easier this year. So I really love uh, working on these projects. They're super smart, dedicated, diverse group of people in the different project teams. And you're meeting some of them today. And I also really enjoy learning about the ways we take care of our waste in the nuclear industry. And we are continuously exploring different ways to improve and innovate in that area. So I'll get into a bit more about what I do on the next slide, please, Rachel. So what does my team do? I'm representing a team of people today and we all work uh, in Indigenous and stakeholder relations. And basically, CNL wants people to know what we do, what we're doing right now, and what we plan to do. With the projects, Indigenous and public involvement is essential to the environmental assessments. And that's from a regulatory standpoint, and also, and more importantly, because it's only right that people who stand to be impacted by the project are engaged and informed and have a say in how that project is carried out. So my role in particular involves sharing information about our projects, ensuring people have the details they need to share back their thoughts and concerns about the projects. And since my educational background, I didn't mention this before, but I have a, a degree in philosophy and political science. Uh, this means I need to learn from the project teams too, and all the people you're meeting today about the technical and scientific sides of the project. 
So I sometimes joke that my job is basically a translator. I'm translating project speak or engineering talk, sorry, Jeff, into everyday language. <laughs> and we do this through engaging with the public, First Nations, and Métis communities to listen to concerns and areas of interest. And then we take these interesting concerns back to determine how they are going to uh, be impacted by the project. So in terms of engagement for both NPD and WR1, we've done presentations, information sessions, site visits, participation in public events, uh, media relations so that involves making sure we have the right spokespeople, spokespeople talking to local media, national media. Uh, we've done virtual open houses during the pandemic and technical briefings in person and virtually, as well as webinars like this one today. And I'll give a quick shout out to the other team members who are supporting the coordination of this, uh, Rachel, Jolene, and Mike. So the four photos here show some of our engagement activities which we've carried out since the projects began in 2016. On the top right, we have an information session at the Pinawa High School back in 2017. The bottom left, or sorry, I'm getting those wrong. The, the top left is the Pinawa High School. Bottom right is a few members of the WR1 project team with the representatives of the Manitoba Métis Federation. And then the other two photos are from two different open houses that we've had at the NPD facility over the past few years. So please do email us any other questions about the project. It's me and my team that are on, on the receiving end of those emails and try to connect you with the right information and share your thoughts and concerns back to the project. So we feed that back into WR1 and NPD. So thanks and thanks for tuning in and back to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Margo, and for all your hard work translating everything I do. Uh, next, uh, we're going to talk about environmental protection and monitoring at CML. And for that, I'm gonna turn you over to Peter Bilks. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Vilks. I was born in Hamilton, Ontario, but grew up in Nova Scotia. I've been in Pinawa for 36 years, originally working at a for ACL as part of the Nuclear Fuel Waste Management Program. I have stayed here for such a long time since I can do two of my favorite sports here, cross-country skiing and rowing. The uh, photo on the uh, left is my daughter and I, we were about to start the uh, 54 kilometer American Berkebeiner race in Wisconsin. Uh, the other photo on the right is my son and I, and we're racing uh, a double in the Northwest International Rowing Asso Association Championship Regatta held this that year in Minnesota. And bottom uh, right is my family. Anyway, uh, the, uh, I am basically a geochemist by training, and most of my career has focused on improving our understanding of contaminant transport through water or through groundwater, mostly. Um, I am currently an environmental specialist working for, as part of the environmental protection uh, team at Whiteshell. Next slide, please. Um, Environmental protection is something that we must do as part of our license, and it provides oversight uh, of present day decommissioning and operational activities. It provides confidence that we are good stewards of the environment in the present and in the future. Now, there are three components that help ensure that we do not release harmful contamination to the environment and public. First of all, it's the, our effluent verification monitoring program uh, that monitors uh, airborne and liquid effluents uh, from the site, and it ensures that we do not release harmful contamination. The next important program is environment, uh, environmental monitoring of soil, river sediments, vegetation, animals, fish, water, groundwater, cultivated and natural food, and land gamma surveys. And we do this to confirm that the environment and human health has not been affected by contamination released from white shell laboratories. 
The groundwater monitoring program is also an important aspect because it's, it's designed to improve the understanding of groundwater flow systems and to demonstrate that they are not contrib contributing to contaminant migration. And what we do to support the uh, project. Uh, first of all, um, the, uh, we support the uh, project through the impact model that describes the transport of contaminants from the white shell site to local inhabitants inhabitants. This is based on transport mechanisms and assumptions of what the local population eats, drinks, and breathes. This provides the framework for the WR1 safety case. Uh, we also do geochemical calculations. So for example, uh, 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 calculating what the solubility of uh, lead might be or thorium. And uh, it uh, it also talks about uh, sorption on, uh, from groundwater to, to rock. Um, and also environmental monitor, monitoring has included participation from the Manitoba Métis Federation and First Nations. Um, and we do this for our own benefit because we have an interest in expanding our environmental monitoring to include uh, uh, traditional foods and medicines that uh, could be found on our site in the local inhabitant, local area. Um, that's all I have. On to you, Jeff. Thanks very much, Peter. And I can certainly confirm the uh, the the quality of the rowing team that uh, the, uh, Peter leads uh, down here in Pinawa. I've seen them pull a, a water skier behind a rowboat and uh, and keep them up. Uh, moving along at quite a quite a tick uh, down the Winnipeg River here. So it's quite an impressive thing to see. But finally, uh, now from our safety and licensing team, I was very ready to introduce Graham Porter, but as we're all humans with chaotic lives, he sadly was unable to join us today. Uh, but again, because I'm the project manager and it always falls to me to, to keep the, this party going, I will uh, do my best to, uh, to tell you about Graham and what he brings to our what he brings to our project. So uh, next slide. Graham is originally from the northwest of England and moved to Canada about 17 years ago. As part of the NPD decommissioning team, his main role is producing the safety case and supporting the licensing aspects of the NPD project and collaborating with his counterparts on the WR1 project and other CML projects. He has nearly 30 years of experience in safety and licensing work and has worked all over the world on all kinds of big projects, including oil, gas, rail, and nuclear. On the personal side, he really does love uh, fishing and spending a lot of time on the Ottawa River fishing, boating, and has recently learned to sail, I'm told, uh, and also enjoys just spending time taking in the views from his home uh, with his dogs. So on the top right, he can point out that double rainbow is the, the shot out of just off his back door there. So uh, I think if we, if we all spend a little bit of time there, we'd be as happy as him. Next slide, please. Now, Graham is one of our safety and licensing specialists who's responsible for demonstrating the safety of our work at CNL and the compliance of our work with the, our CNSC license. And uh, they do this by selecting and applying different assessment strategies and using complementary indicators sometimes to demonstrate the robustness and long-term safety of CNL projects. Specific to the MPD project that he's working on, uh, he's authored the safety case report for the project to demonstrate uh, using all of the available evidence that the project is safe. Um, and his safety case supports the regulatory process as a required document. It helps inform decisions on additional work that should be conducted by the project to improve or uh, better justify or demonstrate safety, and as well serves as a tool for communicating and engaging with people around the safety of the project throughout its entire life cycle. But uh, really, there you have it. Um, next slide, please. That's just a, a few of the shining members of our team. Uh, this is not everybody uh, there. Everybody you've seen here has at least three people just like them working just as hard. Uh, but uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't spend all day telling you about how awesome all of them are. Um, we hope this slightly less technical webinar gave you a better idea of who we are as people and what we do here at CNL. And uh, this time I believe we're gonna open up the floor for questions. 
Um, if this was a telethon, we'd start panning the camera around and showing you all of our smiling phone operators ready to take your call. But uh, thanks to modern technology, we don't, we don't need a room full of uh, rotary dial phones anymore. Uh, and uh, between Mike, Rachel, Jolene, and uh, Margo, they are going to be uh, able to take care of you quite well using the Q&A function here. So I'll stop talking and I'll turn it over to Mike to see if we have any questions that have come in so far. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, great presentation. Uh, just uh, want to remind people about the Q and A function at the bottom, and uh, we'll just wait a few seconds for uh, for some questions to come in. Okay, so first one. Um, if I heard correctly, uh, Mr. Miller suggested that the in situ disposal will ensure containment of the radiological risks until they decay to an acceptable level. Is this correct? And if so, when will these risks decay? When will these risks decay to that acceptable level? Uh, yeah, I, I'll, uh, I'll take my first kick at this, and I'll, I'll, I'll open up the floor to any of our other attendees or other presenters if they have anything to add. But um, certainly. Uh, the safety case has been put together and and i'll ref i'll get our communications people to put a link to it uh in the in the chat or send it out with the minutes here uh, we have done a present a webinar previously on the safety case for both of these projects uh with the story for how we uh, we justify their long-term safety so um when it comes to uh containment over the long term so we recognize that the grout that's going to be used and the structures of the reactor hall that are in place now uh, will not last forever. Um, so our safety case for the product doesn't rely on them to last forever. Uh, we, we model the slow decay of the components, the slow decay of the, um, the, the grout and the reactor structures themselves and demonstrate that through the life cycle of that facility that the risks, radiological risks from those facilities um, are below, below acceptable levels. So even as those barriers start to break down, the facility itself still remains passively safe because of the, uh, the time is that things have been allowed to decay and the, the limited movement that will occur even as those barriers start to degrade over time. I don't know if there's anybody, anybody else wants to jump in and add anything there, or uh, but hopefully I've answered your question, and certainly we'll get you a link to that previous webinar we've done on the on the safety case that highlights uh, specific questions just like this. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, next one: um, Is there coordination between these two projects? Absolutely. Uh, just the, our webinar today is, uh, is good evidence of that. So Margo works, works primarily with the NPD team, um, same with uh, Courtney, but uh, we all have a very good working relationship and we do spend a lot of time discussing our, our projects. We compare feedback that we get both from the regulator and from the public on our respective projects, share those with each other and, and modify our, our own documents to, uh, to incorporate feedback that the other projects have received. We also collaborate well with the NSDF project uh, and a lot of the feedback that they receive has worked its way into both the NPD and the WR1 uh, documentation as well. So short answer, yes. Okay, uh, perfect, thank you. Um, Uh, just to follow up from the the one before, um, is there? Can you go into more specifics about the timeline as to when the the, the risks will decay to an acceptable level? I can. I don't have. I won't have the exact date in front of me um, for just the, the different topic today. And again, I'll just refer back to the the uh, webinar on the safety case. But it is in the tens of thousands of years. Um, do we have within the safety case, there are um, comparisons to natural analogs, uh, superficial ore deposits, um, uh, things of that type in terms of their activity levels and a demonstration of when our projects, uh, assuming no, nothing is um, nothing is released, uh, when those will reach similar levels. 
and it's on it is on the order of tens of thousands to uh, to hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, that being said, however, uh, those are additional lines of evidence showing that the uh, when they will become ready for uh, delicensing or when they would officially be not required to have a license. Um, it's the project itself and the safety case that we put forward uh, acknowledges that it, they may not reach a, uh, a background level to what you might see in a, a less radioactive, um, naturally radioactive environment, but still demonstrating that the risks from the facility as it is are below acceptable levels, well below acceptable levels by orders of magnitude. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, has your monitoring included the watersheds from Northwestern Ontario and Pinawa, Manitoba areas? Can I answer that? Uh, actually, uh, not from Northwestern Ontario, except for we do monitor the Winnipeg River, which has its uh, origins from the Lake of the Woods and has some input from Northwest Ontario, but that would be the extent of it. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, the next question coming in is, how is in situ disposal different from the near surface disposal facility? I can take that one, Mike, it's Courtney. So in simplest terms, the in situ disposal really means carrying out disposal in place. So the in situ disposal for the MPD facility um, and WR1, they're gonna safely encapsulate or contain the below grade reactor systems to ensure um, that the structure is in place underground. And this varies from NSDF because NSDF is an uh, engineered containment mound that is going to be placed, proposed to be in placed at the Chalk River facility. If anybody else wants to jump in on that, welcome to. Thanks for that, Courtney. And certainly if there's a follow-up question to any of that, uh, please throw it into the questions and we'll uh, try to get some better refinement on that and, and make sure we answer your question. Oh, there's the follow-up. Uh, which is safer, in situ or NSDF? So that's a, it's not a, sim it's not a simple black and white question. So uh, every, nuclear related activity in Canada is regulated by the CNSC and the CNSC has regulations that limit what the risks are, what, what an acceptable risk is from any facility. And those, those high level restrictions apply to, to everything, to the NSDF, to either of these disposal projects, to any other disposal project in the future, uh, to uh, uranium mine um, uh, tailings ponds and, and other, uh, other uh, fringe radioactive activities. Uh, and that is that no member of the public shall receive a dose greater than one millisievert per year. That is, that's the base law in Canada. Um, and then from that, there are additional guidelines for um, uh, accounting for other sources of exposure as part of your, your assessment. So assuming that your project or, or the one particular exposure pathway uh, is not the only thing a person would be exposed to, you should also consider setting a lower dose limit of less than 0.3 millisieverts per year as your, your kind of your safe limit to account for the possibility that there might be other facilities or other exposure points uh, to those people in the future. Further to that, even uh, our projects have all demonstrated that the, the risks, uh, the radiological risks or the potential doses from the projects are thousands to tens of thousands of times lower than even that 0.3 millisieverts per year, uh, almost to the point where it would be difficult uh, to measure, um, to, to even indicate that there is anything there beyond what's in the, the background. Uh, so each facility has its own um, particular type of waste that it's dealing with, its own particular type of conditions, its own uh, like natural conditions. Um, and they all have to meet the same safety benchmark. So it's not that any one is safer than any other one. They all have their merits and their, uh, the reasons why they're appropriate to be used where they're being used, uh, but they, they will all provide a sufficient level of safety and, and generally will ex greatly exceed that level of safety um, for every application. Hi, Jeff, Margo here. And, and I'll just add that we, did do a deep dive into the safety case for the NSDF project as well. I 
kind of shares how what you're saying, Jeff, how it measures up and how it lines up with the regulatory guidelines for that particular kind of waste. And I will drop that into the chat too. So we'll have we'll have different webinars on all the safety cases for the projects. And then again, if you're looking for more specific information about this topic, please feel free to email us at ermstakeholder at cnl.ca. I'll put that in the chat as well. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Margo. Okay. Um, uh, a follow-up to uh, a previous answer. Uh, the 10,000 to 100,000 year timeline uh, required, does it require that institutional controls be maintained over that time period? So there, there's two aspects. So there's the, the requirement from law and the requirement for safety. So um, both the NPD and, and NSDF or NPD and WRON projects, uh, our safety case is not based on there being institutional controls to maintain that level of safety. They are, they are, we're demonstrating that they are passively safe. So in the event that institutional controls are lost or fail, the systems will continue to function as they're intended to, and they'll still be passively safe. Um, the CNSC does require that sites containing nuclear materials over a certain level have a license. And so we have committed to uh, institutional controls for as long as that uh, their authority requires that those still be in place. So um, we have proposed within our documentation a minimum of 100 years. Uh, that's not to say at 100 years we're going to stop having institutional controls. 100 years is just the amount of time we need to demonstrate that the facility is performing as we expect. And then at that point, uh, we could make the decision to propose uh, scaling back, reducing, changing, or, or leaving as is any institutional controls that are in place. But they would remain in place until the CNSC or whatever uh, body having jurisdiction at the time uh, would, dis would agree that we could reduce or change or eliminate any of those uh, um, institutional controls. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, can, questions continue to come in. Um, is in situ disposal pre planned before commissioning or post planned after decommissioning? So, and, and I, I apologize if I'm not interpreting your question correctly, but uh, in, in the case of WR1 and NPD, uh, both of those facilities are still, uh, still standing. They have not been decommissioned yet, at least not fully. There have been partial decommissioning activities that have taken place to move them into storage with surveillance. So um, your removal of fuel, draining of fluids, um, removal of some control systems. Um, but the facilities are still intact and still require decommissioning. So our, right now it, it is pre-planned. Uh, to do in-situ disposal before we move forward with uh, decommissioning and putting it into that um, in-situ disposal configuration. I can add to that, Jeff. Sure. Um, so basically those two projects, they undergo an alternative means assessment to determine that uh, the most preferable option would be in-situ disposal and that would go forward with an environmental assessment. Maybe we'll take a quick moment here to jump back to a previous question. So the question was around um, uh, sampling in the watersheds of Northwestern Ontario and Pinawa. Uh, so just to, to be explicit too, we certainly do have sampling locations uh, in Pinawa uh, upstream of the site uh, through Lac de Bonny, uh, down through MacArthur Falls, uh, uh, downstream of the site. Uh, and we have an extensive network of uh, groundwater boreholes and uh, partnerships with even some local communities for uh, biological samples, either from plants, animals, uh, road kills, hunt, hunt kills, uh, things like that. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, now we will uh, take the time to uh, ask those uh, in attendance, <clears throat> uh, if uh, they would like any topic covered uh, for future webinars on the uh, WR1 and MPD projects, um, to write them in the chat function. Um, any topics at all you'd like us to cover at uh, future webinars.
Um, please put them in the chat now. That'll help us plan uh, as we move forward with these two projects. So Mike, I think there's a nice, nice segue here. There was one last question that popped up uh, from Sarah and it's, it's about CNL's vision for the future of nuclear. And uh, it, it's more of a comment around uh, proposals for small modular nuclear reactors. So we do have some webinars. Our, our team is focused on the environmental remediation side of CNL, but we do have some webinars about what we're planning for the future at CNL around nuclear science and technology and supporting the industry as well as uh, adjacent industries and what we're looking at in terms of uh, some of the more exciting things that you might say are our, our, our focus on health, including our research into uh, targeted alpha therapy, which is a promising cancer treatment with a radioisotope called actinium-225, as well as uh, hydrogen technologies. But I will link a webinar that kind of focuses more on that and take take a note that maybe that's a good topic for future webinars to, to kind of put together how our work on the environmental remediation side of things is related to the future plans for CNL. And um, the small module reactor question, there is a licensing process going on right now with Chalk River Laboratories for the siting of a micromodular reactor. And that is uh, in collaboration with a uh, organization called Global First Power that would be the proponent for that project. But again, I'll drop some information on in the chat on that. Back to you, Mike. Perfect. Thank you, Margo. <clears throat> um, the comment uh, um, that's in our chat from Sarah, uh, yes, we will take your, uh, your email address down. Um, so thanks for uh, reaching out and wanting to be a part of these uh, future webinars. Okay, so we are, so looks like we'll do a couple more. Um, okay, so there's one one question left. So let's do one more so we can kind of wrap things up as we uh, kind of have three webinars back to back to back. <laughs> uh, our next one is on the NSDF. Uh, okay, so has the option to completely remove uh, the components in the two reactors that are high risk and send them to a single repository. Why is CNL planning to maintain two in situ sites where one would be more cost effective? Certainly, I can start with this one. And uh, Courtney, if you have anything to add, certainly jump in from the NPD side. Um, further to what Courtney was saying, uh, we. Our environmental impact statement, uh, chapter two, contains a, a, a fulsome section looking at project alternatives. And one of those is to remove portions of, of WR1 and transfer it to uh, Chalk River for long-term storage until a final disposal facility is available. Uh, and that was looked at. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the criteria or one, one, of the, one of the aspects of that, that that provides some uncertainty is that there is no facility for some of these components currently. And there isn't one planned. Uh, so, in the interest of uh, reducing deferment periods and dealing with our uh, dealing with our our legacy liabilities now with the technologies we have, uh, this was a path forward to safely um, deal with the the legacy liabilities in, in these two reactors right now. Uh, with the the you know, looking forward to the future, if a facility does become available, there are other reactors uh, within Canada too that that may be a, a better option for once those uh, facilities or those plans are in place. But at this time, there is uh, this is uh, an appropriate and um, and safe way to deal with the waste that we have at WR1 and NPD. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and that will uh, wrap up um, our webinar today. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And uh, just to, if you, you hang on a couple minutes and, and can think of um, a topic for a future webinar, you can still put them in the chat uh, function. Um, and the links to this recording, we're going to, uh, once we post them on YouTube, we'll, uh, 
we will send the, the links out uh, to everybody who signed up for this webinar and uh, please distribute those to those uh, who might be interested. Uh, if you have any future questions or any more questions or anything at all, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, email our uh, stakeholder relations team at ermstakeholder at cnl.ca. Uh, so thank you uh, everybody for watching. Um, I believe I, I can speak for uh, Jeff, Courtney, Peter, Margo, Jesse, uh, and Rachel. Um, thank you uh, very much for attending and uh, we look forward to um, doing this again. So thank you.